I'm Diane Sayre, and I am one of the members of the LaRouche slate for federal Congress, and I'm running here in the Democratic primary in the 5th Congressional District. And here with me is Dave Christie, who is, go ahead, stand up. <laughs> And uh, he is one of the LaRouche candidates. He's running for U.S. Congress in the state of Washington in the ninth, that's right, the ninth congressional district. And also is Cody Jones, who is, uh, and he is part of what's known as LaRouche's basement team, which are a group of people collaborating very closely on scientific breakthroughs of key strategic importance if mankind is going to survive. And Cody is on the website, for those of you who are on the website, he's on there every week with Mr. LaRouche and Sky Shields and presenting now some really important breakthrough material which he'll go through here at the meeting. <clears throat> It is the case that right now uh, we are headed for thermonuclear war. And I wanted to start with remarks or a, um, an editorial written by a man named Aruf Ben, which appeared in the Haaretz newspaper in Israel, where he reports that when Bibi Netanyahu was here in the United States meeting with Barack Obama, although Obama made a display of pretending that he is urging the Israelis to restrain themselves, that we will protect Israel, and so on, apparently what occurred, according to Ben, is that Obama told Netanyahu that if the Israelis were to launch a strike against Iran, that the United States would back them up. And he actually quotes Netanyahu saying that what you've heard the expression, what looks like a duck, what acts like a duck, what looks like preparation for war, what acts like preparation for war, and quacks like preparation for war is a preparation for war and not just a bluff. So that's what's in the Israeli press. Well, Obama, of course, claims in public that he's urging the Israelis to show restraint, but if people remember, Obama was just here, or not here, he came to Newark actually with David Cameron, the British Prime Minister, and Obama made a toast to Cameron, toasting 60 years of Queen Elizabeth's reign, and then basically pledged that we're all her subjects. My answer, <laughs> we're the, yes, subjects of the queen. This is, you know, 236 years uh, later. And I can say that my family didn't come over here on the Mayflower, my ancestors, so that I could grow up and be a subject of the queen. <laughs> so, uh, <laughs> I don't know, do you think Obama might lie? <laughs> Although maybe he just has a really weird interpretation of the Constitution. After all, he went to Harvard. Um, <laughs> he claimed that when we were dropping billions of dollars worth of bombs on Libya that we were doing a humanitarian mission and therefore he did not need to go to the Congress. And Kucinich said rather aptly that he didn't know why we had to respond to Pearl Harbor since that was probably also a humanitarian mission by Obama's standards. The Japanese were probably bombing us to prevent human rights violations. So um, what we know from Israel, which further underscores what Ben was saying, is that the Israeli cabinet before Netanyahu made his trip to the United States, largely opposed Israel striking Iran. And most Israelis, including Dagan and other people from the Israeli intelligence and so on, oppose such a war. Who wants to be a hand grenade for the British Empire? But after Netanyahu returned from the United States, suddenly now six out of eight Israeli cabinets are, members are supporting the war. So that's pretty strong evidence that indeed such a meeting did occur. The other thing that's happened, which most people here are probably aware of, is that 
there was a full page ad taken out in the Washington Post by a very distinguished group of retired generals, the former head of CENTCOM, Joseph Hoare, Anthony Zinni, people who had been outspoken against the Iraq wars of the Bush administration. And in this ad, they quoted from the sitting head of the Joint Chiefs, General Dempsey, they quoted from Leon Panetta. Now, the acting head of the Joint Chiefs and the Defense Secretary, I'm sure, were aware that quotes from them would be in this ad. I don't think a group of retired generals would just go out and take an ad in the Washington Post quoting people in Obama's administration and not inform them. And the ad was entitled, uh, Mr. President, Say No to a War of Choice with Iran. And it had a picture of Bibi Netanyahu and Obama together. So you have to ask yourself, why would the military be going to such extraordinary lengths to put an ad in the Washington Post saying, don't do this war unless it's very clear that we're headed for war? And obviously, they don't think they can reason with the president, because if they could, they would just talk to him. They wouldn't take out an ad in the Washington Post. Then uh, the New York Times just ran an interview with a number of generals. They've just completed some kind of military exercises, war games in the Gulf region, and they practice different scenarios. And the first scenario is an Israeli strike on Iran, and then Iran retaliates hitting a U.S. naval vessel killing 200 Americans. And of course, if Iran hits 200 Americans, then you know the United States is smack in the middle of this war. And in fact, this was a proposal made by some Israelis earlier that one way they could make sure to get the U.S. in is if they strike Iran, that Iran would hit American targets in the region to be pulled into this. So the military commanders involved in this exercise told the New York Times, this is a no-win situation. We don't know where this would go. We should not do this. We can see it would be out of control in no time. Now further, uh, the Saudis are producing more petroleum right now than they have produced in 30 years. And there are 11 super tankers of petroleum, that's 22 million barrels, on their way here to the United States to arrive in May. So what I would say is that this is acting like preparation for war. This is a preparation for war. That's what's going on right now. And in spite of the efforts of LaRouche and our organization since last November, to put the brakes on, we did delay it. The reason they killed Gaddafi was because they didn't have time for a trial. They didn't want Gaddafi put on trial because then you might find out things like the fact that he gave money to Sarkozy's election campaign, um, all kinds of other deals that were occurring. So they wanted him dead and out of the way so they could move with this war. So we knew since last fall that they were headed for this and, and that is where we are right now. And because of masses, massive opposition from the US military, from forces in Israel, we're not in the war yet. But LaRouche keeps making the point that the only way that you can know that we're not actually going to have this war is Obama's removal. And given this, and given that the Russians and Chinese have made no secret, the average American may not know that Medvedev, the president of Russia, went on national Russian television and said, we're putting our anti-missile systems on combat readiness, and we are on combat alert, and China has said the same thing. Certainly people in the State Department know this. Certainly people in the US Congress ought to know this. So you have to ask, given this, given that it's clear that we Obama is not even listening to the top generals who don't want this war, why is the Democratic Party supporting this guy? Why are they going along with him? And then you could also ask, given that Obama is such a nut job, why did the Republican Party choose such a despicable bunch of candidates? So what you have is, is a disaster. You have Obama on the one hand who is committed to a policy which will lead us to thermonuclear annihilation. And on the other hand, you have people like Santorum and Romney and company who would be prepared to launch the war faster than Obama. And that's what people have as a choice right now for uh, presidential candidates. 
But then the actual question is, why, why are the American people tolerating this? And you can say, well, a lot of people aren't tolerating it because they just got depressed and they're hiding under their beds. <laughs> they're, they're not, you know, they're not even participating anymore, which is what most people are doing. I mean, I have to say I was at the Sussex County Democrats meeting a couple nights here ago here, and, um, you know, they are not even able to recruit enough Obama delegates. They can't find people to be delegates for Obama. And we're finding this around the country. Dave was uh, describing an event he was at in Washington State where someone from the DNC had to come and say, look, I know there's a lot of things that people really aren't that happy about, but we've really got to, I mean, what is this? So they know it's rotten, but people are in such a locked in mindset that they're prepared to march off the cliff. So what, what I've been thinking about is what LaRouche keeps saying about the degeneration of the American population over the last three generations. And you take LaRouche, he's 89, he'll be 90 in September. And everyone who knows someone who is in their 80s or 90s, there's a bit of a different character to them. Like if someone in that age bracket has had two hip replacements and pneumonia, and you visit them in the hospital and you say, how are you doing? And they'll say, I'm coming along. <laughs> Whereas if you ask someone in the baby boomer generation, how are you? Then what you get is a long list of what happened the last time they went to the massage therapist, the pedicure, what kind of medication they're taking, they have indigestion, arthritis, rheumatism, et cetera. And then if you get to the really young generation between like 16 and 25, ask one of these young people, how are you? And they look at you and what's going on in their head is, why do you care? And then the other thing they're thinking is they wonder, people are wondering, what would it be like to kill someone? What would it be like to be in a flash mob and, and destroy a store? And, and am I going to get a chance to do that before I get killed myself? So what you see is a total cultural collapse of the generations uh, since World War II. And what's really clear to a young person today, if we don't make a very substantial change, is that there really is no future. There is nothing to think about. People, young people you ask today, and, and I did some work in Washington, D.C., um, organizing children's choruses, and I happened to work with children whose parents were drug addicts, and a very aggressive, strong woman in the neighborhood took over a foreclosed house and had all these kids come in after school and fed them and did their homework with them. But these, children's, these children had seen things by the time that they were 10 that you would hope no one ever saw even in combat. And one of them, who was 11 years old, when you asked him what he wanted to do with his life, what he did was he gave me a very detailed description of what he wanted at his funeral. So the question is, how did we get into this mess? And can we pull mankind back from this mess at this late date? And obviously, I think the answer to that question is yes, or I wouldn't be running for office. <laughs> um, <laughs> and uh, what Cody and Dave are going to do is make that more clear as to why the answer is yes. But I would just say, if you take a step back, it actually took a really huge fanatical effort of some people with a lot of money and power to reduce the American population to this ugly state. Um, and I wanted to just review actually the identity of the United States and why we are here as a republic. There was a problem in Europe, it was a mess, 
And you had certain discoveries, like in 332 BC, you had Eratosthenes, you had the collaboration of Greece and Egypt. Eratosthenes had figured out how to measure the circumference of the Earth. And you had Maui, who actually traveled uh, around the Earth um, hundreds of years before Christ. But what happened with the Roman Empire? And you had the destruction of these ideas. You had the Peloponnesian Wars. And there's a scene, I don't know how many people here are familiar with the movie On the Beach. People know about this movie. You know, it. it's a movie where it's about a degenerate culture, which it has had a nuclear war has begun, and people are on the beach in Australia or somewhere, and everyone's just, they all know they're going to die. So what you have is every kind of horrible degenerate action going on that people want to do before they die. It's a population that has lost sight of its humanity. And one of the things that I was really struck by when I read the um, Thucydides Peloponnesian War is there's a, a part in the war where they get the plague. And you have to realize the whole war is organized through sophistry, a lot like the way our politicians talk today. Uh -huh. So you have these long dialogues about why it's so necessary to invade this island or do this, and then it goes back and forth, and it's all based on lies. There's no principle. So the population is clearly very corrupt. So what happens is in the middle of this war, you get the plague, and people tend to die very quickly, and it's highly contagious. So what happens is when the plague strikes, Everybody just decides to do everything that they would never get away with, sleep with their friend's wife, steal everything so they can have a few moments of pleasure. It's, it's absolutely hideously disgusting. And, and you know, they, the Peloponnesian Wars wiped out uh, civilization to a large extent. And the Roman Empire, now it's interesting because in the middle of the Roman Empire, you had the birth of Christ, but you didn't really have an idea, a civilization based on the principles that Christ was promoting for about 800 years. And that happened under Charlemagne. And when Charlemagne was building canals and cathedrals and teaching language and raising the standard of living in Europe, you had in Baghdad, the Baghdad Caliphate, you had Harun al-Rashid who was very, very good friends with Charlemagne. I don't, I don't think they ever met. But their friendship was mediated by a group of Jews in Eastern Europe. So what you had was an incredible collaboration among Muslims, Jews, and Christians based on the conception of man and the image of God. And what happened during this period is that uh, the... Baghdad Caliphate got paper from China, so they began working on written language, and this spread into Europe. So you had a whole development of a written language and culture. You had science. A lot of the first medical science came from Ibn Sina, who was a little bit later than Harun al-Rashid. And you had a real flourishing of civilization. But again, the empire took over, and the first is Muslim extremist was a guy named Al-Ghazali. And Al-Ghazali said that you cannot have science and religion, that Islam is not compatible with scientific progress. And what he did was he had all the books burned of everyone who had made these breakthroughs in that region. It was a total attack. And then as people know later, you had the Christian extremists in the form of the Inquisition in Spain and the Moors and the Jews were driven out of Spain. So this, this was why people like Leibniz and Cusa said, we cannot, we're never going to be able to have a republic. We're never going to be ha able to have a government worthy of what it means to be human in Europe because it looks like every time you begin to get a breakthrough, you get some throwback to this Roman Empire oligarchical outlook, people promoting the view that human beings are animals, and you're not allowed to make discoveries, and you're not allowed to do things that are beautiful, and we're going to crush you. And Kuza, who LaRouche talks about a lot, uh, came to prominence in the 1400s. He led a huge fight within the Catholic Church, which was about to split. 
he organized the Council of Florence in 1469 and at least temporarily stopped the church from splitting. But what Cusa also did is his intervention in science was a work called On Learned Ignorance. And it's very much like Socrates, but more advanced, which is the idea is that the key to knowledge, the key to knowing anything is to know that you don't know. And to and then to realize, though, it doesn't mean that it can't be known. See, those people who say, oh, it doesn't matter, you can't know anyway, whatever you want, whatever feels good. No, there's true principles. There's universal principles which are true, but because we're limited by nature that we're here in the physical world, we will not get to know these true principles perfectly. But when you make a discovery, you have a less and less imperfect knowledge of something that is a true principle. And it's really interesting because what you see in all the great scientists, in Kepler, Einstein, Cusa, people who made great discoveries, is that every single great scientist actually has a very, very profound faith in a creator because what they're discovering is that the universe is so incredibly beautifully composed that it could not possibly be randomly thrown here. So what happened was a conspiracy was hatched that somehow the, the best ideas of this European civilization had to go somewhere else if you were going to be allowed to let them flourish, if you were going to have a government that was going to value the creativity of human beings of the human mind that you were going to have to get off the European continent and go to the new world. And that's why people came here. And if you think about what's in the Declaration of Independence, it says that all men are created equal, that they are endowed by their creator with certain inalienable rights, that among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Now you notice it doesn't say the pursuit of pleasure. <laughs> and it's interesting because when you think of pleasure you say well it's the opposite of pain or pleasure is you know it's sensual it's what feels good to the senses like eating a lot of chocolate ice cream <laughs> and of course invariably when you pursue pleasure it actually turns out to not be that happy because when you're pursuing something that's shallow that only appeals to the senses, what happens is your mind and your soul become bogged down and corrupt. And this is a really interesting paradox because you have to say, well, what did, what did they mean? Why did they say, why is it a right, the pursuit of happiness? What, what is so precious about that? What are we talking about? Because, you know, the Declaration of Independence, they list all these grievances, all of these rotten things that the British were doing to the American colonies. So part of it, of course, was very literal. You did need to defend your life. You did, you did need protection against being kidnapped and forced into the British Navy and having your property taken. These were all very literal things. But what is this, the pursuit of happiness? And it's worth thinking... Um, of what really makes you happy. And you see it with children. Like if you're watching a child learn how to do things and they figure out how to put something together for the first time and their face totally lights up, or when they figure out a word, like the most happy word that children figure out is no. <laughs> and when they figure out the word, they get really excited about the power of this word that it seems to really have a big impact <laughs> if you use it. Uh, so there's a certain, and everyone's had the experience where there's a problem where you just can't figure out how to resolve it or something that doesn't make sense. And you think about it and you think about it and you sleep on it. And then one minute you have this, it's like a eureka moment and all of a sudden in a flash, it comes together. Well, that's human. That's uniquely human. There is no animal that does that. There is no animal that goes off, you know, they're trying to solve a problem, they go off, spend time by themselves, <laughs> and come up with a solution, you know, come back when they figure it out. It doesn't happen. It's only human. And, and that is something that people get profound happiness out of. So imagine the idea of a nation saying that this is an inalienable right of being human. 
to be able to make scientific discoveries, to be able to take joy in creativity and, and the profound joy of feeling that you're getting closer and closer to the mind of the creator of the universe. And you think, and the oligarchy, of course, always opposed this. Why do you think the British ran the opium wars? Why do people call for drug legalization? To destroy that. What's free trade? It's always slavery and drugs. Well, what's slavery? What, what does slavery do? If you have to work 20 hours a day and you don't have adequate food and shelter, how creative are you going to be? If you have to spend every minute trying to figure out how to get by and never have time to think, you chances are pretty good you're not going to become a Beethoven. So what happened in our nation? Well, in this part of the nation, as early as the 1750s, we were actually producing steel. And um, we developed canal systems to transport goods, and we developed rail systems. And by 1876, only 100 years after the founding of the United States, the United States had the highest standard, um, an American citizen had the highest standard of living of anyone on the planet. And that was 10 years after a brutal civil war set up by the British. They were going to come in on the side of the Confederacy. And we lost 600,000 lives. And nonetheless, after that, the United States was still the most powerful industrial nation on the planet with the highest standard of living. That's because of that commitment to this principle. And what, and Kennedy was probably the last president who actually had a glimmer of that understanding. I can't think of anybody since Kennedy who ever made a speech talking about anything 50 years from now. And if you think of his speech on uh, why mankind has to go to the moon, and everyone always thinks of the part where he says, not because it was easy, but because it was hard, but he also, the whole speech is framed in the development of scientific progress of the human race. And at one point he quotes, I forget who it is, an explorer who, who died climbing Mount Everest. And he said, well, why did he climb it? He said, because it is there. And Kennedy says, well, space is there, and so we're going to climb that. And his whole identity and sense of mission for the United States was rooted in the intent of the founding of the United States, which is this principle of human creativity. And after we went to the moon, the whole world was overjoyed. A lot of the astronauts were going to little villages in Africa, and people were coming up saying, we went to the moon, we went to the moon. This was seen as a breakthrough for mankind. We also got, as people know, all kinds of medical breakthroughs, all kinds of uh, industrial breakthroughs, and even, I almost hate to bring it up, but in case there's anyone here who still thinks in terms of money, <laughs> For every dollar that was spent on the space program, we got $14 back in all kinds of spin-offs and technology and growth. So now what do people say about the space program? We've got Obama. Obama says, why should we go back to the moon? We've been there already. <laughs> Imagine if the pilgrims had said that. We don't need to go to the New World. Christopher Columbus already went there, and Maui was there before that. Why should we go there? Um, and then you have a lot of people today who think we never went to the moon, that it was just a movie. Someone made it up. Uh, and then my favorite one, which you hear all the time, why should we go to the moon? We have so many, why should we spend all that money on the moon? We have all these problems on Earth which I always say, if there's a whole bunch of money on the moon, should we go there and get it? <laughs> I mean, obviously, we didn't spend any money on the moon. <laughs> it was here. So what happened? Kennedy was assassinated. And to make sure that people got it, his brother was assassinated. And the Warren Commission report was put out, which everyone knew was a fraud. But because so many witnesses and other people seemed to get killed or disappeared, and you had you know, the King and the Malcolm X assassinations and the Vietnam War, 
people just decided they were too terrified and they didn't fight. They went along with it. So the president of the United States is assassinated. His brother, who is likely to become president, is assassinated. And the American people say, uh, sorry, we don't want to think about this anymore. The best that I can do is to look out for myself. You can't change City Hall. You're just one person. Take care of yourself. You have to look out for yourself because no one else is going to do it. And that's what happened to the United States. But the question is, what is yourself? Who are you? Who are we as human beings? Are we Beethoven, Einstein, Joan of Arc, Kennedy? Isn't that the identity of a human being? Well, what we were told by the Congress of Cultural Freedom is no. No, what you are is you're a cancerous tumor on the planet. That's from the environmentalist movement. There's too many of you anyway. Small is beautiful. Think globally, but act locally. OK, it's, it's sick. There has been an absolute degenerate culture imposed on the population. Seek out pleasure and avoid pain. If it feels good, do it. So that's what happened. That's how you went from the difference between what you see in members of the World War II generation to what you see in the younger generations today, most of whom right now are barely fit for employment. But. The truth is that human beings are not animals. And that if you have aggressive, truthful leadership in a crisis, that people will respond on their human side. So imagine if the United States were to change course. If we said, we're going to have an aggressive plan to have a manned colony on Mars by the end of the century, that we're going to work with the Russians on the strategic defense of Earth, that is, systems of satellites and lasers to figure out what causes extreme weather, to monitor asteroids, and if one of them is heading our way, to actually knock it off course so we don't go the way of the dinosaurs. This is what the Russians are working on. This is what the, they want the United States to join them in this. But we have a president who says, why should we go back to the moon? who's literally taking our satellites out of the sky. Imagine if every single veteran coming back from Afghanistan and Iraq knew that as soon as they were able, able to work, that there was a job for them in building the United States and defending our planet from these galactic threats. The greatest threat to mankind right now, other than Obama's insanity, <laughs> is from the galaxy. And we should figure it out uh, before we get hit by an asteroid or we have a super volcano blowing up somewhere which creates an ice age from the smoke. So I think that Americans could be mobilized for such a mission. And I know that if we don't mobilize them for such a mission, then we will join the other 98% of species which have gone extinct. So in closing, I would just ask that people pay close attention to what Cody and Dave Christie have to say, and then we'll take questions from people at the end. Thanks.